This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Here we go. Thomas and Friends Season 5. The season everyone has been waiting for. I have very fond memories of Season 5. Granted, I have fond memories of all the first five seasons. But Season 5 was unique because it was the new season. When I was a kid, Seasons 1 through 4 were all already out, and I viewed all those pretty much together at once. Season 5's premiere was when I saw brand new episodes of Thomas for the first time. And with a new narrator, too. It was a really exciting time. Season 5 is quite the season, with a lot riding on it. It was the last season of many things. The last to use the props in their original conditions. The last to have episodes written by series creator Britt Allcroft. And is what many consider the last of the golden years of Thomas. So, let's dive in. Thomas the Tank Engine had reached the height of its popularity in the 90s after four very successful seasons. The show was global now, now dubbed in several languages and being regularly aired in countries all around the world. Merchandise and home videos were selling like hotcakes. It was the time to be a Thomas fan. In the midst of its popularity, creator Britt Allcroft had plans in the works for a Thomas film. In 1996, she was approached by Paramount Pictures and signed a contract to write a script. After going through production hell, that movie would eventually become Thomas and the Magic Railroad in 2000. But before she could get that movie made, Allcroft needed to show just what Thomas could produce on a cinematic scale. In this lead-up to the movie's production, a fifth season was greenlit, and Allcroft saw this as their time to really push the envelope. Allcroft requested director David Mitten really show off his modeling and filmmaking skills this year. The two opted to stray away from the original Railway series books once and for all, and write all original scripts this year that would allow them to film out-of-this-world scenarios, like a dam collapsing or a giant boulder running loose on the railway. Wilbert Audrey had sadly passed in 1997, but it did mean that they necessarily didn't have to stick to his written material anymore. It was a risky decision to stray away from the original book's source material, but considering by this point Audrey himself was already pretty upset with the direction the show was going, it's really no shock they decided to take this leap. No restraints meant that they could have total creative freedom over every episode this time, and that was imperative for a season that had a potential movie deal writing on it. Inspiration for story ideas came from David Maidment, a former manager for the London Midland region of British Railways and the founder of the Railway Children Charity. He served as the railway consultant for this season, and was keen on the show using actual railway events to base their new stories on. Some were based on simple slice-of-life events that he recalled, such as a ram breaking into the station house, which actually happened at the abandoned station house at Clan Hilleth, as well as more known events such as the Gare Montparnasse station crash in Paris. These particular events became the basis for the episodes Ba and A Better View for Gordon, respectively. In return for his work, Allcroft wrote Maidment a check for £10,000, which he then donated to his Railway Children charity. So wholesome. These newer, larger-than-life episodes required the team to really bring their A-game when it came to set building and filming. Several new stunt sets were built with the intention of being used once for some grand spectacle moment, such as this dam set, built just to be destroyed. Kirk Ronan Station, built with the intention of plowing Gordon through its rear wall, or the sheds on this quarry set that were blown to smithereens. Thanks to the surplus of rushes that were leaked this year courtesy of user Thomas Tank Merch, we have first-hand experience now just of how much hell the team went through to film all of these impressive sequences. The amount of outtakes there are of Boulder chasing the engines, or the lorry falling off a cliff, 
or Gordon smashing through the station wall is really outstanding. They did four takes of this. They had to rebuild the wall every single time they did a new crash take. Absolutely bonkers. These tapes really show just how much work it took to produce a show like Thomas, with all practical models and no CGI. And this stuff will always be impressive. They used this opportunity to fix up props that proved troublesome in the past, most notably the narrow gauge engines. All new larger narrow gauge engines were built after the smaller season 4 ones proved difficult to work with. They built an entirely new larger scale to accommodate these bigger engines, complete with bigger rolling stock, buildings, and people figures so they never looked out of scale. Now with bigger machines to work with, no longer did they have to hide the battery boxes and the rolling stock behind the engines or have to worry about the wheel motions jamming. These new props would be used for the remainder of the series. When it came to the English-speaking narrators, Michelangelus once again returned to narrate the UK dub. The US dub, however, saw a change. Thomas was able to stand on its own legs in America now without being catalyst by Shining Time Station. Following the cancellation of that series, George Carlin officially took his leave as Mr. Conductor and the narrator. And so stepped in Alec Baldwin. Yes, THE Alec Baldwin of Hollywood fame. He was signed onto the series as the narrator for two seasons, and would go on to play Mr. Conductor in Thomas and the Magic Railroad. Where were you? Thomas, for the third time in a row, had scored celebrity talent. Season 5 completed its production in early 1998, and the season premiered later that year in September with the episode, Cranky Bugs. Unlike all the seasons prior, Season 5 strays completely away from having a strict continuity, and each episode is episodic. It's rather similar to Season 3 in that regard. There is a large, big picture, overarching continuity, like new characters that are introduced do reappear as part of the world, and new additions to landmarks remain permanent throughout later episodes, etc. But the overall structure is very loose. You can watch most of this season out of order, and it doesn't really feel like you've missed anything. And this would become the template for the show moving forward. As every classic season has done so far, Season 5 continues the tradition of building out the world of Sodor even more than ever, exploring all new territory that we haven't seen yet. Just to recap, Season 1 was Mainline and Thomas's branch line. Season 2 really focused on Edward's line. Season 3 focused a lot on the West Coast, and Season 4 was the narrow gauge railways in the mountains. Season 5 relished in exploring all the old abandoned parts of the island. There was a real air of mysticism in this season, tapping into the unknown long forgotten parts of Sodor and the supernatural elements that comes with that. There's a lot of stories that deal with ghosts and the paranormal this year. There was also a lot of focus on Toby's old line this year, showing places that we haven't seen since Season 1, like Arlesdale End. The theme of once old and lost, but found and made new again, was absolutely a running theme throughout all of Season 5. Each season seems to have something unique to it in how it was filmed. Season 1's thing was a static camera with details in the foregrounds of wide shots to make the sets look like paintings. Season 2 loved moving the camera around and playing with panning shots, etc. Season 5's thing is straight on character tracking shots. Countlessly over this season we get shots of the camera placed directly in front of a character as they're traveling. They've done this sort of technique before, it's not really new, but they've never done it at this scale, and they do it so sparingly after this season too. These head-on shots are honestly quite intimidating, especially when the character is traveling at speed. You get a nice sense of the weight and power of the engine when it seems the camera is attached to it. Season 5 loved its tracking shots. When it comes to sets, I think design-wise, Season 4 was the peak of the series. Nothing really beats those beautiful mountain wonderland scenes from that season. Though I will give Season 5 credit. It does create some breathtaking frames at times. These ones of Toby in the forest come to mind. And not to mention how impressive some of its stunt sets are. I guess the set design comes down to the type of season that they were making. Season 4 was all about being comfy and taking in the scenic places the little engines traveled to, while Season 5's goal was more to be exciting and adventurous. 
The sets were designed with stunts in mind, more so than creating a pretty frame. And perhaps it's a bit unfair to say one is better than the other. I will say this though, the engine props themselves look the best in this season. I don't know what shades of blue and green they used on the main characters, but those slightly darker shades make them look the best that they have ever looked, complete with that glossy sheen. They look so real, the least toy-like of any season. Let's talk about the score. The score this year sounds so cinematic, varying so much depending on what type of episode they're making. Sometimes it's adventurous and atmospheric. Sometimes it's cute and whimsical. Sometimes it's tense and heart-pounding and never lets up. Sometimes it's mysterious and downright creepy. The range Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell implemented in the score this year is nothing short of awesome. I've made this comparison before, but the music itself is a subtle reflection of the characters and their series-long arcs as well. Compare Thomas's theme back in Season 1. It's very fast and playful, very forward-moving, reflecting Thomas's youthful, impatient, cheeky, eager character back then. And as the seasons go on, the theme becomes slower and more orchestral as he grows as a character and gains some humility. The theme now in Season 5 feels so masterful, made completely up of an orchestra. It's so much slower and grander and fuller, reflecting the more mature, cooled down and experienced character Thomas is now. I love the musical storytelling of classic Thomas. The score's evolvement over time alone tells a story in itself. Let's talk about the narrators this year. First off, I want to talk about Michael Angelus. Michael Angelus has been around since season 3, and I'll be totally honest, I haven't exactly loved him in the show so far. I didn't really care for his performance in season 3, he sounds like he's reading the lines too fast for my liking. He was much better in season 4, and he won me over in several episodes. Season 5 though. This was Angelus' peak. Without question, this is my favorite season of his. Yikes! Help! Save me! A quick thinking shunter did just in time. What was that? exclaimed James. His performance is so on point this year. He reads at a perfect pace that matches the pace of the episodes. And he reads his lines in a way that adds to the mysticism and the tone of the stories. Rusty is sure that on a clear night it is gazing up at the mountain and that its sighs are being carried on the wind to where it once used to stand, proud and silent. I wonder if Rusty is right, don't you? Not to mention his funny ad-libs. She's got a dog, said Percy. I'm off off. Season 5 is the best Angelus season, no question. Now let's talk about Alec Baldwin. I love Baldwin as a Thomas narrator, especially in this season. Baldwin's natural voice is very classic American Hollywood male sounding, super dramatic and theatrical. And what better season to have a man of Hollywood talent narrating than this one? The one with explosions, runaways, ghosts, and disasters all around. His natural speaking voice adds such a level of dramatic tone to scenes making them feel much more serious and adult than they actually are. We should have left this part of the island alone. He makes them almost feel like mini-movies. Not to mention, it just sounds like Baldwin himself is having a blast behind the mic. He gives all the characters a unique voice and delivers their lines with such energy. He goes all out with them. We engines run this island, said Henry. That's my line of cars. It's not. It's mine. Yours is over there. It's mine. It's not. It's mine. Slot! They'll come back to spook you and your special funnel. Woo! Oh, help! cried James. Go away! They are all so cartoony and flanderized, yes, but I kind of love that. Especially Gordon. Harold thinks he can go faster than me. 
I'll show him. Important engines like me should have a panoramic view, where I can see people and people can see me. I'm the greatest. Just watch me fly by. Who is he yelling at here? Himself? <laughs> is he trying to psych himself up? All the characters are so snippy this year. Everyone is so hot-headed, and it seems like they all have a bone to pick with someone about something. The sky's empty. Like your smoke box, Percy. Laugh, James. One day I'll show you just what a big engine can really do. So what can a big engine really do? Not speak to silly little green engines for a start. The character banter is at an all-time high. Call yourself a car? You're a disgrace to the road. Find yourself a scrapyard. I've never heard so many savage comments from Thomas characters in my life. Your color's nice, James. Pity about your face, though. To me, this is the best version of Thomas and Friends, and is very in the spirit of the original books. The engines are all selfish jerks in some way or another, always complaining, and through the course of the episodes do they learn to, well, basically not be jerks. That's like the moral of the whole show, and it's so entertaining here. The stories this year may not be based on the books, but these still feel like the characters straight from the pages. Arsdale End. That's my home, replied Toby. That's why I like it, especially when you're there and not here saying I'm silly. Good night. But the thing that season 5 excels at, over any other season before and after it, is tone. Season 5 plays with tone so often and so successfully. Scary episodes, adventurous episodes, funny episodes, fast-paced runaway episodes, slower heartwarming episodes with feel-good morals. One episode will be, Oh my god, that ship just crashed into a dock and knocked Cranky over, oh my god! And then the next episode is a nice slice of life tale about how Sir Topham Hatt goes through hell and high water to get to his wife's birthday. Aww, he finally gets there in the end, and despite what he looks like, she's still so happy to see him. And she kisses him and everyone laughs, aww, it's so feel good. And then in the next episode, the dam collapses and sweeps Toby away, and Toby's going to go over a waterfall! Oh my god, he's gonna die! Oh Oh no! And then the next one is about how Percy finds a good luck package for Mrs. Kindly's daughter's wedding. And aww, he even gets a kiss at the end. Oh, how cute. Holy shit, a giant boulder is chasing the engines and going to kill everyone! Oh my god, the shed just exploded! Ah! Every episode is totally unique and different. You never know what you're going to get with season 5. This is a season I envy new fans of the show for. I wish I could experience this crazy adventure again for the first time. It is a ride and a half. Season 5 was sort of back to basics, funnily enough, when it came to its characters. It is majorly focused on the main cast. The main characters have a lot more to do this season than they did last year. This is not a season that is as evenly dispersed as, say, Season 3 was where every character present had something to do that year. Nah, this time a few faces aren't forgotten, but I suppose that's inevitable as the cast grows more and more each year. Edward and Duck both don't do much, albeit a few speaking lines here and there, and that won't be uncommon later on, just wait. Donald and Douglas strangely don't appear, a couple narrow gauge faces are absent, but not too many. Many secondary characters were given time in the spotlight though. Characters like Stepney, Bill and Ben, George, and even Toad the Brake Van get whole episodes to themselves. Unlike Season 4, I feel like Season 5 had a much healthier mix of stories focused on the mains and on its supporting cast. In third place this year, we have a two-way tie between James and Toby with three lead roles each. In second is Thomas with five. And in first, to no one's surprise, is Percy with a whopping eight lead roles. Percy continues to get more and more lead roles than Thomas each season. Why isn't he the main character at this point? First character I'd like to talk about is Toby, who had a great year. This is definitely my favorite Toby season. I loved all the focus on his old line and that part of Sodor that only he really ever ventures to. Toby's episodes were very adventurous, exploring a long abandoned seemingly mystical part of Sodor and taking on a collapsing dam. Both pretty badass of him. I really like seeing this braver version of Toby that seeks adventure that the later seasons just sort of totally forgot about. Henry also had a pretty good year, with both his episodes featuring awesome crashes. Henry has always been the softer of the big three. 
Gordon and James are always jerks, and Henry was usually the more sympathetic one. Not this year, though. Henry is a full-on jerk this time around, and I am all here for it. I love Jerk Henry. You're late, and that smell is making me ill. You're the only danger on the rails, Thomas. Now stop wasting time and get your cars hitched to my train. Jeez, Henry, lay off a bit, would ya? I'd like to give Toad a shout out as well. Toad, this seemingly nothing brake van character that's been around for a few seasons now, finally is given a spotlight episode where we learn a bit more about what makes him tick. Tired of traveling backwards at the end of trains, he desires to lead a train of his own and gets his wish in a way he never expected, and giving us probably the craziest runaway sequence ever in the series. It's nice that they decided to give a nobody like Toad his own story. Busy going backwards was definitely the moment in the show that they realized he, of all characters, could be a leading man. No pun intended. And it makes his dynamic with Oliver even more interesting. I like how in both episodes that feature the two, both open with them just openly talking about their problems and desires with each other. In Busy Going Backwards, it's Toad that's unloading and Oliver listening and advising. In Oliver's Find, it's the other way around. Nice little partnership these two have. There were a handful of new characters this year, and interestingly, all of them only really appear in this one season alone. New faces like Old Slowcoach, Derek, the Hard Lorries, and Thumper never really are ever seen again, with the exception of Cranky. Cranky the Crane makes his big debut this year in the season's premiere episode, and he really made an impact. I love the concept of Cranky, it feels very inspired to me. This giant sentient crane that is an ass to the engines because he is, quite literally, their superior. No crane has ever complained before. Well, I'm complaining now! He has a character arc in his first episode, of course, but it's nice that that edge he has never has fully gone away over the years. Cranky definitely becomes a staple of the series after this season. The show knew they struck gold with this guy. The fact he's still a prominent character in the reboot kind of says it all, doesn't it? Probably the non-Audrey character with the biggest impact on the show, to be honest. Thomas and Friends just doesn't feel complete without Cranky. Thomas is honestly one of the highlights of the season for me. This is like the only season in the entire show where Thomas feels like he has grown up and reached his maturity peak. For four seasons, we've witnessed a very gradual character arc for him, going from the naughty little prick he was back in season one, and over years of making mistakes and being humbled through embarrassment and learning arcs, slowly he's matured into a respected, worldly member of the team. Moments like this one and Make Someone Happy really stand out to me. Percy or Oliver should do it. I'm too important. James, why don't you think about something or someone else for a change? You'll be surprised at how much better you'll feel if you do. Thomas, the one who would play pranks on others and make silly mistakes and be impatient and rude and call others names and was generally selfish, is now the one who is telling the big engines that they shouldn't be selfish and shape up. It's a great character moment. I really love this more adult, straight man Thomas in this season, and I wish he had stayed like that for the remainder of the show, really. Really wonderful character development. He is still, of course, the same Thomas we all know and love, though, and those little cheeky or impatient moments of his still do pop up. Beware of the ghost, Toby, Thomas said. What ghost? the old warrior ghost. Every night he lights his fire, then goes hunting. Toot toot! Goodbye! Some things never change. And of course, Percy. This is such a heavy Percy season. Eight whole episodes where he takes the lead or plays a big part in, not to mention all his appearances in other episodes. This season shows Percy at his angriest, with such angst, at his boiling point. For seasons, he's been pushed around as the little guy of the railway. And finally, he's had enough and claps back. Most of Percy's stories this time around feature him as upset or unhappy with some facet of his life. And then he finds himself at some crazy big obstacle that he has to overcome. Most notably, getting stuck at a collapsing mine, chasing down a runaway train, and heroically rescuing Toby from going over the falls. He really takes command of that Littlest Engines have the biggest adventures trope that the series loves. But at the same time, we also get sweet stories with Percy too, like when he had to find a good luck package for Mrs. Kindly's daughter's wedding, or saving old Slowcoach from being scrapped, or helping Maithwaite win the Best Dressed Station Award. Percy has such a big range this season, 
and definitely had the most adventures of anyone on the cast. I was so close to giving Percy the MVP award this year. I actually went into this expecting to give it to him, but after writing out the script, I decided that I think the award actually should go to Sir Topham Hat. Sir Topham Hat, the fat controller himself, just might be the most dynamic character of season 5, with the most information revealed about him. The humans have always been an important part of Thomas, but season 5 in particular really pushed humans as leading characters. A couple episodes this year were centered around the big man himself, which is a first for the show. They actually humanized him, no pun intended, and showed he isn't just the authority figure that barks orders at the engines. He's a person with a personality and desires. He loves his family, he loves adventure, he shows genuine concern for his engines, and he has a good sense of humor. And I'll eat my hat if you don't like it. Then Harold landed. The wind from his blades blew Sir Topham Hat's hat off. Well, seems I wouldn't be able to eat my hat even if I had to. In one episode, he goes through hell and back just to get to his wife's birthday party. And in another, he just wants to have a nice vacation with his family, only to have it continually sabotaged. In another, he spends a day with his grandchildren and explores an unknown part of Sodor with them. We even meet his mother for the first time this year. That's a neat little piece of world building. I never expected to learn so much about the guy. And I definitely look at him in a different way after all they did with him this year. I know this was my special birthday party, but I didn't know it was fancy dress. Sorry, Percy. You'll win an MVP award soon. I promise. Episodes are going to be fun to talk about, because there's so many I feel I need to touch on. This year's standout episode goes to Rusty and the Boulder. This episode is the epitome of experimental, possibly the most experimental episode of the entire series. The pitch was, what if Indiana Jones, but with trains? On paper, that sounds ridiculous, but somehow they made it work. No doubt the episode with the giant boulder that chases the little engines and causes havoc would go on to have a long-lasting legacy. The visual of it is so striking. Everyone remembers this one. And obviously so, as they still make merchandise of it to this day. It is definitely not the most realistic episode of the series, but I appreciate the grander themes this episode taps into. It poses that great age-old question. How much should humans intervene with nature? The Fat Controller builds a quarry in an old left-alone part of Sodor, and in retaliation, a boulder breaks loose and destroys the railway. Was it really human intervention that caused Boulder to break loose from his perch? Or was there something more supernatural beyond our understanding happening there? Was that nature clapping back? We should have left this part of the island alone. The episode is open-ended and leaves the viewer to draw their own conclusions. Quite a heavy topic for young viewers and such a powerful way to end the season. Easily the season standout. I also think Toby and the Flood deserves a mention, for also being an extremely experimental feat. A disaster movie, but with trains. I love the serious tone of this one, and how the episode never lets up. It plays its concept completely straight throughout until the end. It's a wild ride from start to finish, with a score that'll keep your heart pounding. Worst episode of the season, I think, goes to Gordon and the Gremlin. This is really the things just happen episode. There isn't really a plot, it's just a string of events that don't really correlate with each other. Gordon has troubles firing up because of gremlins in his firebox, and then Thomas collects Topham's mom, and then Gordon takes her, and then Thomas takes her again for some reason, and then they just go back to the docks, and then she leaves and the episode ends. Why did she come to Sodor just to travel around on the trains? Why did Gordon collect her from Thomas just to take her back to Thomas? What does the dog have to do with any of it? I don't know, it's, it's a very nothing episode in my opinion that I don't think I really get, if that makes sense. I feel like the Gremlins joke would have paid off better if Gremlin the dog had hopped into Gordon's cab, and then at the end there's a line from someone like, Wow Gordon, you really did have a Gremlin in your cab after all. Just a thought. Though I do love the interactions between Topham and his mom at the end, 
That was very sweet. And she agrees with me. You are indeed really useful engines, and my mother, of course, is always right. <laughs> and the dog is funny. Awful. Make Someone Happy is very much a things just kind of happen type of episode too, with no real hard plot really. But that one has good character moments, notably the opening banter between Thomas and James. So it's worthy of that, at least. Sum up of the season goes to Thomas, Percy, and Old Slow Coach. It has the fire and excitement and disaster we expect from season 5, but it also has the slower, sadder, more nuanced moments, and a really happy, feel-good, sweet ending. It's everything season 5 has to offer, all in one episode. And now on to my favorite episode. I've talked highly about this one before, and you can probably guess what it is. It's Duncan Gets Spooked. The tone of this episode is unmatched by anything else, and the darkest episode of the series by far. This episode shows an engine's death on screen, and then leaves it up to the viewer's interpretation if that engine's ghost we see later in the episode was real or not. It's quite unsettling, and I don't think any other ghost theme episodes have ever come close to achieving that feeling. The word I would use to describe season 5 is peak. The peak of the classic seasons of Thomas. In so many ways, this is the best the show ever got. Best score of the classic seasons, best dialogue written between the characters, best season narrated by Michael Angelus, the props look the best this year, it's the season that played with tone the best, and it was the peak of Britt and David's working relationship together. Season 5 is easily a lot of people's favorite season, and it very well might be mine as well. This feels like a finale to Classic Thomas, and it kind of is. The movie followed this season, and as we all know, things were just never the same after that. This is the final season this magnificent duo worked on together as writers, producer, and director respectively, and they went out with a bang. And that covers it folks. We've now covered the first five seasons, what many people would say is the classic Thomas era. For a lot of people, Thomas ended here. We still have 20 more seasons to cover, and a movie, the movie that changed everything. But I'll get to that. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this retrospective. I know it's one that many of you have been waiting for for a long time now. I'm happy it's finally out. Thank you all so much for watching, and uh, 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 yep, yep, wait a minute, hold the phone. I still have one thing to share with you all. Get ready. Explain all the questions filmically there so that there's no mistake, there's no misunderstanding, and the story is clear and in very picturesque countryside, and that is the magic of the island of Sodor. What you just saw is a teaser trailer made by Jacob Jarrett at Flying Pringle, 
who has been carefully and quietly developing a brand new full Gage 1 episode of Thomas, picking up where the golden years of the show left off in full Season 5 style. After over two and a half years of work, this new fan-made episode, created all by Jacob, along with the help of Rob, Zeo, Camden, and many others, is set to premiere live at the Great Train Show in Edison, New Jersey on the 26th of November this year. If you're a Thomas fan planning on going to this show, I strongly urge you to check it out. If you aren't able to go to the show, a YouTube upload of the episode will be going live at the same time on Jacob's channel. Link in the description. Keep in mind, something on this scale hasn't been done since the actual model series ended over 15 years ago. This is going to be something really special, and I for one am seriously looking forward to it. Oh, fourth.